really good to be with you guys today. Uh, although I, I fear that the keynote is now just a footnote to what Alan had to say. <laughs> so if you heard that, then this is just commentary on what he said. I want to thank you for the work that you're doing in social justice. Uh, the faith that I grew up in, the churches I grew up in, loved me well and loved scripture sincerely, but they had blinders when reading that scripture about the call to do justice in the world. Uh, and so my kind of late teen, early adulthood, there was this uh, kind of scales falling off of the eyes. I said, wait a second, there's a whole lot of pages in this book that say things that no one was saying to me. So the work that you're doing and how important it is, not just in the impact on current issues in our world, uh, but its impact on other generations as they're coming to understand what does it mean to follow after Jesus in this world. And then it can't be divorced from this practice of justice. So thank you uh, for what you're about and what you're doing. All right, we have a room of mixed generations. It's a polite way of saying some of you guys are old, <laughs> and some of you are young, all right? Uh, so we got to do a little quiz up front. Uh, how many of you are on Instagram? How many? You know, just a show of hands, all right? Uh, Twitter? We got any Twitter users? We got a few? Yeah. Alan, see, there we go. Look at him. <laughs> He's taken to the streets, taken to the Twitter. He's about it. That's good. Uh, Facebook? A little more common? Okay, all right, we good, there we go. Um, so, most of you are familiar with what a hashtag is, if it makes sense, okay. I don't want to rush ahead and someone be like, is it hash browns? What is he talking about? I'm not sure. Uh, so, in case you're unfamiliar, the, the button on your phone that used to be called a pound is no longer called a pound, it's now called a hashtag. You can even make it with your fingers if you want to. Uh, but you, anytime you share something online, whatever topic that you're talking about, uh, whatever issue you're addressing, product that you're buying, place that you're going, you can hashtag the name of that. And that can be clicked and searched. So if 10 million people around the world have hashtag Bishop Peter Rosaza, then you can click that and you can see every picture or every comment that all of those people had made using that one hashtag. Uh, Alright, so that's just kind of the backstory. There is a particular hashtag that at some point I would invite you to look up. Uh, and it's the hashtag of Denali. That's spelled D-E-N-A-L-I. Denali. Uh, and if you search that hashtag online, you will find two very different types of images all mixed in together. Some of those images will be of a 20,000 foot mountain in Alaska, right? And some of the other pictures will be fancy trucks and SUVs that are made by GMC, all right? Who is honestly familiar with both, all right? You know, you know both Denali's. How many of you are like, there's a mountain pole in line? <laughs> All right. That's totally okay. Uh, the marketing plan for GMC, or the budget for GMC's marketing is much bigger than Denali's marketing budget, so not as many people are familiar. But it's interesting that this same name could be applied to two radically different experiences. If you were to climb Denali versus climb into a GMC <laughs> Denali, right? Think about the difference of those experiences. One is an expensive luxury package, and the other is a mountain that is 20,310 feet above sea level. And from base to peak, it's actually further than Mount Everest. It's the third tallest mountain, but base to peak, it's even taller than Everest. It's so large that it has its own localized weather the mountain by itself. And if you wanted to climb the mountain called Denali, it would take months, maybe years, of training and preparation. Expensive gear and equipment. That itself requires training to learn how to use that gear when you're climbing such a mountain. And it takes about three weeks of your life to complete this climb. 
maybe four if the weather isn't cooperated, which it often does not. But if you climb into the GMC Denali, you will have GPS navigation, which is how I got here today. This is my first day in Connecticut ever, right? <laughs> beautiful day, beautiful towns, lots of white buildings and white churches all over the place. It was gorgeous. I had no idea where I was at any point in time because my phone was just saying, in 800 feet, turn left. So I did, right? And then I got here, right? But if you get into a Denali, uh, the car, uh, it's going to have a nice full screen map, three dimensional, up on your dashboard, letting you see everywhere that you're going. You don't have to know directions or be trained to use it because it will just tell you word for word, step for step, what to do. The mountain called Denali is listed among the 10 most dangerous climbs in the world with a success rate of only about 50%. It's only half the people who try complete the mission. There's been over 100 people die making the attempt. Compare that with the safety features of the latest technology in the GMC. Automatic, this car will break if you're not paying, like you're looking at your, like so if you're on Twitter, when Alan's on Twitter, hashtagging social justice, immigrant reform, when he's doing that driving, if he's in a Denali, it will stop him from running over the car in front of him, because it will expertly see that and stop the car without his help. Think about, if they have seats that will pulse and vibrate if you're getting too close to hitting something. Pinging alarms, backup cameras. You don't even have to learn how to park parallel anymore. You just like stop and push a button and it just puts you right in there, right? <laughs> how much more difference could there be in these two Denali's? One is dangerous and inhospitable, extreme and risky. One is protected, safe, warm. Literally, your seats will warm for you in the cold, which I hear you guys have cold in Connecticut. <laughs> we have like two weeks of winter and about eight months of summer, which we're already in the middle of, so I am loving the spring weather. Right? So I sometimes wonder about the kids growing up with like their full entertainment system around them, riding around in Denali, when they will ever learn where that, or if they ever learn where that word came from. I wonder still if the mountain herself is bothered that we have taken her name to use it for such luxury and comfort when she is neither. So if you were to do the hashtag search of Denali, there would be two separate and very different things that you would see. And it makes me think about the way we use biblical words and attach them to things that are so much less than what's being said. Words like hope, redemption, grace, or of course, most significantly, love. Think about the robust and unsettling and profound nature of these words. And then think about some of the things that we attach them to. Growing up in Nashville, Tennessee, there was an annual conference that was put on by the denomination that I was a part of at the time. And the name of this conference was Jubilee. You guys familiar with that word in Scripture? Well, I had not heard that word uh, in its context in Scripture, outside of my reference point of this three-day conference. And at this three-day conference, what we basically did was get out the most persuasive and popular preachers that we could find in our denomination and put them on stage to try to get people to convert to our version of Christianity. Or, if you kind of slid away from it, to get back into the fold. And at some point... I actually was able to read the passages in Scripture that talk about Jubilee. My mind was blown by the difference. Jubilee in Scripture has this complete reordering of the economic and social structure of a society is put on top of an evangelism crusade. Now, I don't want to deny the value of introducing someone to Jesus that does not know Him, but to use the idea of Jubilee for this is very, very different. 
Or think about the millions of ways that we use the phrase Good Samaritan. Right? Uh, it's basically kind of like a, a throwaway term. Uh, for anybody who does something kind in an unexpected way. And it's usually fairly small, something we didn't plan for or expect. But if we look at the Good Samaritan story, there is so much risk involved. This crossing of racial lines, this putting one's life in danger, this going as far as this person could possibly go to ensure that the person wounded on the side of the road was cared for, protected and healed. You know, even the Good Samaritan story itself started with this question, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus wasn't really interested in those arguments on who's someone we should love or not. He was more interested in telling a story of what love looks like in practice. What does love demand? In my hometown, uh, there's a nonprofit called the Hope Center, which is basically where if you have used stuff around your house that you don't need anymore, you can, instead of throwing it away, you can drop it off at the Hope Center, who will resell it for very, very low prices to people who have a limited income. Now, I am totally in support of thrift exchange as a good way to care for our communities. But if you think about this the biblical idea of hope and the way that it's connected to resurrection just makes me wonder if we're using these words correctly. I fear that maybe we have replaced a majestic mountain with a comfortable SUV. I work with a community development organization in Atlanta uh, that's called Focused Community Strategies. We've been partnering with neighborhoods in Atlanta for over 40 years. So we partner with one neighborhood at a time in the city of Atlanta to practice innovative and holistic development. Because we believe and we are in pursuit of flourishing communities. We made a decision years ago, in the early days of the organization, to not just to be about alleviating need or providing for people who had a momentary need. We wanted to see long-term, sustainable, thriving, and flourishing. And we talk about that as the pursuit of God's shalom. Another one of those big Denali-like words in Scripture. This holistic, transformative well-being. You know, in the course of that 40 years of work, our organization has learned a lot, which is a nice way of saying we've failed a lot. We've seen a lot about what works and what does not work. And we have definitely seen how our own well-intentioned, carefully led efforts have often done more harm than good. You know, our founder, as was mentioned a moment ago, has written some books on this, Toxic Charity being one of the ones that's most well-known. And it's a book that just cataloged story after story of all the things that we were doing because we cared, uh, but that had a harmful effect on our neighbors and on our community. And what allowed us to see that our good intentions were not accomplishing good was the fact that our organization has always had a commitment to neighboring. We will live in the places where we serve. Because it's our fundamental belief that proximity changes everything. The closer you get to someone or some place or some issue, the better able you will be able to understand its complexities and the roles that you can and cannot play in addressing them. So we began with this commitment to live in and partner alongside of these communities. Our vision for good charity radically changed. It became clear pretty quickly 
that what we had accepted as the idea of mission or charity or justice was really just a luxury SUV. So perhaps you haven't uh, read a book like Toxic Charity, which is totally fine. I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. You know, I, I hang out with Bob the writer a lot, so I can give you the short version. You don't have to spend the money on the book. But there are other books out there, too. Uh, when Helping Hurts, some friends of ours have written a similar book. Um, as you can see from the title, When Helping Hurts. There's also books, uh, an African economist, Dambisa Moyo, wrote a book called Dead Aid where she examined the trillions of dollars of aid flown into the continent of Africa and the impact it has had. And by the title of the book, kind of like Toxic Charity or Dead Aid, you kind of get the idea that it's not really working. Or maybe you prefer Netflix over a bookstore. And if you've been on Netflix, there's a documentary called Poverty Inc., which does the same thing, to look at how, painfully enough, our charity has become part of, or one of the spokes of the wheel that allows chronic ongoing poverty to continue. That our best intentions haven't had the greatest of impact. So that work, that 40 years of work, uh, led our organization a few years ago to start uh, a part of our work called the Luckman Center, and that's where I uh, work with, with the team that focuses on training. We've worked with uh, organizations uh, that are trying to reimagine and come to understand how can we have healthy and effective impact on the places where we're working. And it's this call to reimagine charity, reimagine mission, reimagine justice. These words that we have so easily accepted and used and chosen scriptures to quote when we do them that maybe it's time to give Denali her name back. There's a parable uh, that, that we have made up and that we use uh, pretty often when we're working with groups uh, about the Cold Water Collective. I'll share that story with you now. There once was a woman who felt called to love and serve the least of these. She found out that in her city there were people who were living with empty buckets. And she looked down at her own bucket and it was full. And she knew that the Jesus she followed said you have to share cups of cold water with those in need. So she decided to travel from her place of abundance into those places of emptiness throughout her city to pour from her abundance into their emptiness. And she was so inspired by this work, she kept doing it week after week for months. She gathered around some of her friends who also were living with empty buckets, or with full buckets, and told them about all the people in the city that had these empty buckets, and she invited them to join her, and they formed the Cold Water Collective. And so week after week for years, they poured from their abundance into the emptiness of others, and it grew from one neighborhood to 50 neighborhoods around the city. And it was hailed as a success. Until one day, one of the women who received this charity asked the question, How come, after years of pouring from your bucket into mine, your bucket stays full and mine stays empty? So the mountain maybe has become an SUV. Because as much as we want to honor the deep impulse within us to see someone in need and to meet that need as quickly and as generously as we possibly can, I believe that Scripture calls us to something deeper than just an immediate response of immediate pain. What does the long-term work of restoration look like? You know, Luke chapter 4 there's this passage, and it's really fascinating to me that in Luke chapter 4, these are the first public words that Jesus shares in his ministry, right? Uh, the Gospels function, each of them function differently and place different stories in different places, but for Luke, he wanted to make sure that the first public thing 
you hear Jesus say was this passage. So Jesus is in the synagogue listening and engaging in the time of study and worship. And the scroll gets passed to him from Isaiah. And he un unrolls that scroll to the place where he wanted to speak at the moment. And he quotes this. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. What does that good news sound like? He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, jubilee. This is this statement that Jesus, as was said a moment ago, is the greatest activist ever known to mankind. But that his existence here in this world was not merely about the forgiveness of sin or the alleviation of momentary hurt. Are you thirsty? Here's water. We should always do that. But at some point, we got to ask the question, why do people stay thirsty? And what are we going to do about that? Are the released, are the prisoners going free or are they just being visited? Because this call of Jesus in Luke 4 is to see... <coughs> Sight returning to the blind. You know, as, you, as it was said, Jesus was reading from the scroll of Isaiah, chapter 61 in our Bibles, even though I hear they didn't have numbers listing out their chapter, chapters the way we do. But in Isaiah 61, there's even more profound verbs or terms that are calling us to having this lasting change and impact, justice in our world. Some of the verses there talk about the people who once were hurting are now being called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display His glory. And I love these two verses specifically. They shall, they shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. They shall repair the ruined cities. That connects really deeply to us at FCS. Because our belief that the neighborhoods where we work, we can provide food and clothing and school supplies and tutoring every day until Jesus returns. But that neighborhood is fundamentally always going to have families caught and chronic poverty, unless we begin to do some rebuilding of those broken places. Because they have been cut off from the systems of thriving. And how do we partner in ways that build up the ancient ruins, that raise up the former devastations, that repair the ruined cities? Listen to the verbs about sight, release, Rebuilding, restoring, are the words like freedom, joy. So, you know, when I think about this, the SUV has a role to play. Alright, so we're not going to just hate on the SUV all day and just love the mountain. Let's take a moment and love the SUV. Alright, what is the value of the GMC Denali in this conversation? Hopefully, to drive you to the mountain called Denali. <laughs> I mean, if you want to walk from here to Alaska, that may be how far Alan, by the time he's done with all this, that may be what he accumulates. Uh, but maybe the role of the SUV is to take us to the mountain. Get us to a place where we are willing to exit that which is safe and comfortable. Because i got to be honest, most of the charity or mission work I did for the majority of my life was pretty safe and comfortable. Uh, it was mostly about my need to make a difference, my need to show that I'm a good Christian that does good things, 
and my need to alleviate the pain I feel when I see someone else in pain. And if I can give or help for a moment, then I feel a bit of relief and I can go on. But the mountain of Denali doesn't let up. It just gets steeper and steeper. I went for a run recently in a city that I was visiting uh, for work and uh, not familiar with it, but so part of what I like to do when I'm somewhere new is just go running, just to find, just to see things, explore, I've never been there before. Uh, and I start to notice that the route I'm taking is like gradually just going down and down and down and immediately clicks in my head, it will all be straight up on the way back. <laughs> I'm loving this run right now. Denali will not let up. We will continue to climb. The air will get thinner as we go. So I think the SUV has a role to play for us. is to get us there. But Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And when Luke made sure we saw those words of Jesus at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, I think he was saying to the church, Church, this is not just Jesus' mission statement. It's yours as well. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us because He has anointed us to bring good news to the poor. He has sent us to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So that we would be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display His glory. That we would build up the ancient ruins, that we will raise up former devastations, that we will repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Perhaps we need to get out and begin our climb. Because if we hashtag these biblical words in the Christian community, there may be two very different and distinct images that we would see. And my hope is that we will choose the mountain. Thank you for your time.